The blessed Mary, being thus prepared, Christ our Savior, arisen and glorious in the company of all the saints and patriarchs, made his appearance. The ever-humble queen prostrated herself upon the ground and adored her divine son, and the Lord raised her up and drew her to himself. In this contact, which was more intimate than the contact with the humanity and the wounds of the Savior sought by Magdalene, the Virgin Mother participated in an extraordinary favor which she alone, as, ex as exempt from sin, could merit. Although it was not the greatest of, favor of the favors she attained on this occasion, yet she could not have received it without failing in her faculties if she had not been previously strengthened by the angels and by the Lord himself. This favor was that the glorious body of her son so closely united itself to that of his purest mother that he penetrated into it, or she into his, as when, for instance, a crystal globe takes up within itself the light of the sun and is saturated with the splendor and beauty of its light. In the same way, the body of the most holy Mary entered into that of her divine Son by this heavenly embrace. It was, as it were, the portal of her intimate knowledge concerning the glory of the most holy soul and body of her Lord. As a consequence of these favors, constituting higher and higher degrees of ineffable gifts, the spirit of the Virgin Mother rose to the knowledge of the most hidden sacraments. In the midst of them, she heard a voice saying to her, quote, My beloved, ascend, ascend higher, unquote, Luke 18.10. By the power of these words, she was entirely transformed and saw the divinity clearly and intuitively, wherein she found complete, though only temporary, rest and reward for all her sorrows and labors. Silence alone here is proper, since reason and language are entirely inadequate to comprehend or express what passed in the Blessed Mary during this beatific vision, the highest she had until then enjoyed. Wow. Let us celebrate this day in wonder and praise, with congratulations and loving and humble thanks for what she then merited for us and for her exultation and joy. For some hours, the heavenly princess continued to enjoy the essence of God with, with her divine son, participating now in his triumph as she had in his torments. Then, by similar, similar degrees, she again descended from this vision and found herself, in the end, reclining on the right arm of the most sacred humanity and regaled in other ways by the right hand of his divinity. Canticles 2.6 She held sweetest converse with her son, concerning the mysteries of his passion and of his glory. In these conferences, she was again inebriated with the wine of love and charity, which now she drank unmeasured from the original fount. All that a mere creature can receive was conferred upon the blessed Mary on this occasion, for, according to our way of conceiving such things, the divine equity wished to compensate the injury, thus I must call it, because I cannot find a more proper word, which a creature so pure and immaculate had undergone in suffering the sorrows and torments of the passion. For, our, as I have mentioned many times before, she suffered the same pains as her son, and now in this mystery she was inundated with a proportionate joy and delight. Then, still remaining in her exalted state, the great lady turned to the holy patriarchs and all the just, recognizing them and speaking to each in succession, praising the Almighty and his liberal mercy to each one of them. She was filled with an especial delight in speaking to her parents, St. Joachim and Anne, with her spouse, St. Joseph, with St. John the Baptist, and with them she conversed more particularly than with the patriarchs and prophets, and with the first parents, Adam and Eve. All of them prostrated themselves before the Heavenly Lady, acknowledging her as the mother of the Redeemer of the world, as the cause of their rescue, and the cojectrix of their redemption. The divine wisdom impelled them thus to venerate and honor her. But the queen of all virtues and the mistress of humility prostrated herself on the ground and reverenced the saints according to their due. This the Lord permitted, because the saints, although they were inferior in grace, were superior in their state of blessedness, endowed with imperishable and eternal glory, while the mother of grace was yet in mortal life and a pilgrim, and had not as yet assumed the state of fruition. 
The presence of Christ our Savior continued during all the conference of Mary with the Holy Fathers. The Most Blessed Mary invited all the angels and saints there present to praise the victor over death, sin, and hell, whereupon all sang new songs, psalms, hymns of glory, and magnificence until this hour arrived when the risen Savior was to appear in other places, as I shall relate in the following chapter. chapter. Instruction which the great queen, the great lady, most holy Mary, gave me. My daughter, rejoice in this very anxiety of not being able to explain in words what thy interior faculties perceive concerning the exalted mysteries recorded in thy writing. To acknowledge oneself conquered by such a, by such sovereign sacraments as these must be looked upon as a victory for creatures, and as redounding to the glory of God and in mortal flesh still more so. <clears throat> I felt the pains of my divine Son, and, although I did not lose my life, I endured the agonies of death mysteriously. Therefore I experienced in myself also this wonderful and mystical resurrection to a most exalted state of grace and activity. The essence of God is infinite, and although the creature can participate in it so highly, Yet there remains much to understand, love, and enjoy. In order that now thou mayest, by the help of thy understanding, trace some of the glory of Christ my Son, of my own and of the saints, I wish to give thee some rules by which thou canst pass on from the consideration of the gifts of the glorified body to those of the soul. <clears throat> thou already knowest that the gifts of the soul are vision, comprehension, and fruition, while thou hast already mentioned those of the body as being clearness, impassibility, subtlety, and agility. Each of these gifts are correspondingly augmented in him who in the state of grace performs the least meritorious work, even if it be no more than removing a straw or giving a cup of water for the love of God. Matthew 10.42 for each of the most insignificant works, the creature gains an increase of these gifts, an increase of clearness exceeding many times the sunlight and added to its state of blessedness, an increase of impassibility by which man recedes from human and earthly corruption farther than what all created efforts and strength could ever effect in resisting or separating itself from such infirmity or changefulness, an increase of subtlety, by which he advances beyond all that could, that could offer it resistance and gains new power of penetration, an increase of agility, surpassing all the activity of birds, of winds, and all other active creatures, such as fire and the elements tending to their center. From this increase of the gifts of the body, merited by good works, thou wilt understand the augmentation of the gifts of the soul, for those of the body are derived from those of the soul and correspond with them. In the beatific vision, each merit secures greater clearness and insight into the divine attributes and perfections than that, acquire, than that acquired by all the doctors and enlightened members of the church. Likewise, the gift of apprehension or possession of the divine object is augmented for the security of the possession of the highest and infinite good makes the tranquility and rest of it, its enjoyment more esteemable than if the soul possessed all that is precious and rich, desirable and worthy of attainment in all creation, even if possessed all at one time. Fruition, the third gift of the soul, on account of the love with which man performs the smallest acts, so exalts the degrees of fruitional love that the greatest love of men here on earth can never be compared thereto, nor can the delight resulting therefrom ever be compared with all the delights of this mortal life. Elevate, therefore, now thy thoughts, my daughter, and from these wonderful rewards gained by one little deed done for God, consider what shall be the lot of the saints, who for the love of God have performed such heroic and magnificent works and have suffered such cruel torments and martyrdom as are known in the Church of Christ. And if these things happen in mere men, subject to faults and imperfections that retard merit, imagine, as far as thou canst, the exaltation of my divine Son, 
then thou wilt feel how limited is human capacity, especially in mortal life, and to comprehend worthily this mystery, and to conceive in a becoming manner such greatness. The most holy soul of my Lord was united substantially to the divinity, and on account of this hypostatic union, the ocean of his divinity necessarily communicated itself to his divine and human personality, beatifying it as participating in the very essence of God in an ineffable manner. Although his glory depended not on merits, since it was given to him as consequent upon the hypostatical union from the first instant of his con conception in my womb, yet the works of the thirty-three years of his life, his being born in poverty, living in labor, loving as a pilgrim, operating in all the virtues, redeeming the human race, founding the church in the doctrines of the faith, all this demanded that the glory of his body be measured by that of his soul, and therefore his greatness is ineffable and immense to be manifested only in eternal life. In connection with the magnificent exaltation of my divine Son, the right hand of the Almighty wrought also in me effects of proportionate effects of proportionate to a mere creature, and in them I forgot all the tribulations and sorrow of the passion. Similar was the lot of the fathers of Limbo and all of, and the other saints when they received their rewards. I forgot the bitterness and labors I had suffered, for the great joy drove out pain, though I never lost from view what my son had suffered for the human race. Some Apparitions of Christ our Savior to the Marys and to the Apostles. The prudence of the Queen in listening to their reports concerning these apparitions of the Lord. After Jesus our Savior, arisen and glorified, has visited, had visited and filled with glory his most blessed mother, he resolved, as the loving father and pastor, to gather the sheep of his flock, which the scandal of his sufferings had disturbed and scattered. The holy patriarchs and all whom he had rescued from limbo continually remained in his company, although they did not manifest themselves and remained invisible during his apparitions. Only our great queen was privileged to see them, knowing, know them, and speak to them all during the time intervening between the resurrection and the ascension of her divine son. Whenever the Lord did not appear to others, he remained with his beloved mother in the cynical nor did she ever leave this place during all the forty days. There she enjoyed the presence of the Redeemer of the world and of the choir of prophets and saints by whom the king and queen were attended. For the purpose of making his resurrection known to his apostles, he began by showing himself to the women, not on account of their weakness, but because they were stronger in their belief and in their hope of the resurrection. For this is the reason why they merited the privilege of being the first to see him arisen. The evangelist Mark, Mark 15, 47, mentions, mentions the special notice which Mary Magdalene and Mary Joseph took to the place where they had seen the body of Jesus deposited. Accordingly, they, with other holy women, went forth on the evening of the Sabbath from the cynical to the city and bought additional ointments and spices in order to return early the following morning to the sepulcher and show their veneration by visiting and anointing the holy body once more. On the Sunday, entirely ignorant of the graves having been sealed and placed under guard by order of Pilate, Matthew 27, 65, they arose before dawn in order to execute their pious design. On their way, they thought only of the difficulty of removing the large stone which they now remembered had been rolled before the opening of the sepulchre, but their love made light of this hindrance though they did not know how to remove it. When they came forth from the house of the cynical, it was yet dark, but before they arrived at the sepulchre, the sun had already dawned and risen, for on that day the three hours of darkness which had intervened at the death of the Savior were compensated by an earlier sunrise. This miracle will harmonize the statements of St. Mark and of St. John, of whom the one says that the Marys came after sunrise, and the other that it was yet dark. Mark 16, 2, John 20, the number 20, and the number 1. For both speak truly, that they went forth very early and before dawn, 
and that the sun, by its more sudden and exhilarated flight, had already risen at their arrival at the grave, though they tarried not on the short way. The sepulcher was in an arched vault, as in a cave, the entrance to which was covered by a large stone slab. Within, somewhat to one side and raised from the ground, was the hollow slab wherein the body of the Savior rested. A little before the Marys thought and spoke of the difficulty of removing the stone, a violent and wonderful quaking or trembling of the earth took place. At the same time, an angel of the Lord opened the sepulchre and cast aside the stone that covered and obstructed the entrance. Matthew 28, 2. At this noise and the earthquake, the guards of the sepulchre fell prostrate to the earth, struck motionless with fear and consternation, although they did not see the Lord. For the body of the Lord was no more in the grave. He had already risen and issued from the mon monument before the angel cast aside the stone. The Marys, though in some fear, took heart and were encouraged by God to approach and enter the vault. Near the entrance they saw the angel who had thrown aside the stone, seated upon it, refulgent in countenance and in snow-white garments. Mark 16.5 He spoke to them, saying, quote, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Unquote. The holy women entered, and seeing the sepulchre vacant, they were filled with grief, for as yet they were more deeply affected at seeing the Lord absent than by the words of the angel. Then they saw two other angels seated at each end of the slab, who said to them, quote, Why seek you the living with the dead? Remember how he spoke unto you when he was yet in Galilee, Luke 26, 4-5, that he was to rise on the third day. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There you shall see him. Unquote. Mark sixteen seventeen. Being thus reminded by the angels, the Marys remembered that what their divine master had said. Assured of his resurrection, they hastened away from the sepulchre and gave an account to the eleven apostles and the other followers of the Lord. But many of these were so shaken in their faith and so forgetful of the words of their Master and Redeemer that they thought this story of the holy women a mere hallucination. Luke 24:11. While the holy women, full of trembling and joy, related to the apostles what they had seen, the sentinels at the grave awoke from their stupor and regained the use of their senses. As they saw the sepulcher open and emptied of the sacred body, they fled to give notice of the event to the princes and priests. Matthew 11:14. These were cast into great consternation and called a meeting in order to determine <coughs> what was so patent that it could not remain hidden. <coughs> Excuse me. They concluded to offer to the soldiers much money to induce them to say that during their sleep the disciples of Jesus had come and stolen the body from the grave. The priests, having assured the guards of immunity and protection, spread this lie among the Jews. Many were so foolish as to believe it, and there are some in our own day who are obstinate and blind enough to give it credit and who prefer to accept the testimony of witnesses who acknowledged that they were asleep during the time of which they testify. Although the disciples and apostles considered the tale of the Mary's mere preposterous talk, St. Peter and St. John, desirous of convincing themselves with their own eyes, departed in all haste to the sepulcher, closely followed by the holy women, John, the number 20, and the number 3. St. John arrived first, and without entering, saw the winding sheets laid to one side, he waited for the arrival of St. Peter, who, passing the other apostle, entered first. Both of them saw that the sacred body was not in the tomb. St. John, then, was assured of what he had begun to believe when he had seen the great change in the Queen of Heaven, as I have related in the foregoing chapter, and he then professed his belief. The two apostles returned to give an account of the wonder they had seen in the sepulchre. The Marys remained in a place apart from the sepulchre, and wonderingly commented on the events. Mary Magdalene, in great excitement and tears, re-entered the sepulchre to reconnoiter. Although the apostles had not seen the angels, she saw them, and they asked her, quote, Woman, why dost thou weep? 
unquote, John, the number 20 and the number 5. She answered, quote, because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him, unquote. With this answer, she left the garden where the sepulcher was and met the Lord. She did not know him, but thought it was the gardener. And the Lord also asked her, quote, woman, why weepest thou? Whom dost thou seek? Unquote. John 15. Magdalene, ignorant of his being the Lord, answered them as if he were the gardener, and without further reflection, she said, quote, Sir, if thou hast taken him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away, unquote. Then the loving master said, Mary, and in pronouncing her name, he permitted himself to be recognized by the tone of his voice. Glory be to the risen King, Christ our Savior and God. May the Lord bless and keep you.